Well, hello everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 129. So glad you could join me. Um, before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this because we love poetry, and I know you do too, so please do click the like button and share. Make sure you're subscribed. Ring the bell for notification. Leave reviews places. Whatever you do, click something that can help spread poetry around the internet, because that's what we're trying to do here. So please help us out if you would in that way. Now, today's guest is Lester Graves Lennon. We'll be with him in just a little bit. But before we begin with that, I thought we would talk to today's featured poet on Rattle.com, uh, the Poet Respond poem of the day, On a Day of Remembrance by Jed Myers. And uh, here he is, Jed Myers, joining us right now. Hey, Jed, how are you doing? Good morning, Tim. It's wonderful to be here and be with you. Yeah, it's finally, it's great to see you for the first time. The, the thing I love about this show is we get to see people that we've known for a long time. And you've been, we've published you, I don't know when the first time we published you was, but it was a long time ago. And, uh, yeah. you know, and, and we published you in Poets Respond and then the regular issues. Uh, it's really cool to, to see you for the first time. Good to see you. So do you want to explain a little bit about what, what inspired this poem, um, On a Day of Remembrance? Well, you know, uh, I've, I've grown up an American Jew. I was born in the early 50s. My grandmother told me about all these millions of people that Hitler killed and all the millions of people that we killed, you know, the uh, including, you know, our dropping bombs in Japan and World War Two. And in history, you learn about, uh, you know, the winning of the West and the, the slaughter of the, the native people. And it all fell together in me through the years as a sort of universalized sense of our murderousness. Mm -hmm. And that that's to me, the heart of the matter when we see examples of mass murder and uh, genocidal behavior, including the, you know, the glaring and profound instance of, uh, of what happened in World War II with the Third Reich uh, uh, with the Jews. And so we crossed this mark of the, uh, you know, International um, Holocaust Remembrance Day. And at the same time, there was a bit of news about mouse being taken out of the curriculum in a school in Tennessee. And uh, it, it you know just moved me to write to write a poem. Uh, there, there it is. Yeah, I think it's a really important message too that it's not just this one instance because we have. I, I think it's a, a kind of the um, availability heuristic, you know, where it's such a salient memory in our history that we think yeah. of like you know fascism and that kind of genocide manifesting in the one way when right. it's 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 a feature like you say of um of human nature that we all have like locked inside of us as part of our evolutionary psychology and something we need to be aware of um anytime yeah. we're you know outgrouping anybody um we need to be aware of that that's what we're doing that that's this tribal impulse to say that anybody outside of our tribe is unclean um there's all the research into um yeah. into um um what's it called the disgust the disgust response that people have. And, 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 and so the, um, you know, and Zyklon B being used originally as a, as a rat poison for fumigation for, um, for, for factories, you know, this whole thing is all tied up together. And so, uh, I don't know, it's just an important thing to bring up in this tight little well-crafted poem. I'm appreciate you could share it with us. I'll, I'll read it. Yeah, go ahead. I'll put it up on screen. On a day of remembrance, International Holocaust Remembrance Day, January 27th, 2022. Let's remember how they thought they were finally cleaning things up, taking care of the rodent problem. Not strange, the same way we had the man spray downstairs when moths had invaded the carpet. You know how your scalp will itch when you hear there are lice. Let's remember this. Inheritance meant to make our skin crawl at the chance of a spider, a scorpion, ants. Older than ancient. Ancestral. Remembrance. Let it spread across every checkpoint and wired wall to touch all our swatting hands. Yeah, such a beautifully, beautifully crafted little poem. Thanks so much for sharing that, Jed, and for being with us today. Thank you, Tim. Yep, have a good one. It was uh, Jed Meyer with On This Day, On the Day of Remembrance. 
And now we're going to go to another poet. Um, I, I can't decide if we should have the two, you know, if we have a poem midweek, I can't decide if I should have it on this, you know, before we actually publish it or after. So in the, sh- in the notes, in the, sh- in the commentary, let me know what you prefer. Do you like to wait? Do you like it to be a surprise on Tuesday or not? I can't decide. But let's call up Sarah Sethia, who's the poet for Tuesday. And um, I definitely like sharing it on these broadcasts. Uh, but I also don't want to, you know, ruin the surprise for Tuesday. So I don't know what we should do in this instance. So let me know what you think about this. Uh Uh-oh. Let's see. So Sarah, we had uh, connected before. Let me try again. Let's see. Well, maybe this will answer that question for me. If I can't connect with Sarah today, maybe we'll just have her on next week. Let's try this one more time. The thing is, the news event that the poem is about um, fits right now. You know, it's something worth talking about as soon as possible, given the nature of Poets Respond. Yeah, so Sarah isn't online. I think maybe, hmm. Yeah, I think we'll try to talk to Sarah next week, and we'll leave this poem as a surprise. But you know who the poet is. It's Sarah Sethia. Um, She's in India, so it's very late at night there. Maybe we'll, we'll try to make sure Skype is working uh, and, and talk to her next week. Instead, well, let's do a random, uh, let's go back in time and look for a poem uh, Look for, for a poem from the archives. I always love to do this week, last year. Oh, wait, there's Sarah. Let's strike Sarah again. Never mind. There we go. So it's connecting this time. So um, I don't know what the issue was there. Okay, we're just not connecting. Uh, let, we'll, we'll try it again next week. Let's let's go to um, let's go to the, the archives and look at an older poem. This is uh, Richard Garcia's poem, Sublime. Hmm. And um, and what does he say? This is from January twenty ninth, two thousand seventeen. And um, I'm not even sure what he's referring to. <laughs> What happened then? Oh, I think that was the, uh, was that the inauguration of, of Trump? Yeah, I guess so. And, and Richard Garcia just says, a terrible beauty has been born. And this is his poem, The Sublime, from January 29th, 2017. Get a little smaller. Yeah, here's Richard Garcia. The Sublime. Now... When they remember it, they think that perhaps they had heard the approach of the sublime, like a distant hum of huge machinery long before it arrived. As it drew closer, there was no mistaking it as hundreds of swaths of trees in the forest across the valley lay down in supplication. Some of the survivors describe it as an approaching shadow, Some say it became midnight in the afternoon and they saw constellations they had never seen before or since. Others say it was a conflagration. The air was on fire, houses and trees exploding before the flames even touched them. Some say the sublime was ice or even just a deep silence. The only thing survivors agree on is that they could not take their eyes off of it. If there had been music, and some say there was, it would have been the ride of the Valkyries. And they stood there, their weapons like toys dangling from their hands, staring up at the advancing sublime. Shit, they said, and fuck, and God, they said. My God. Once again, that was Richard Garcia reading his poem, The Sublime. And um, that was the poem from January 19th, 2027. 
And we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to get to our main guest. And I'm going to let the dog in, because I think the dog is barking, and I don't think there's anybody to let him in. So I will be right back, and uh, we'll be right back with uh, with Lester Graves Lennon, today's guest. And we're back. Thanks, everybody, for your patience. As I mentioned, today's guest is Lennon Gra- Lester Graves Lennon. Um, Lester is a poet, editor, and investment banker. His first book of poetry, The Upward Curve of Earth and Heavens, is found in more than 70 public and university libraries, including UC Berkeley, Yale, Harvard, and Oxford. His second book, My Father Was a Poet, was published in the spring of 2013. And his third book is just out, Lynchings, Postcards from America, um, and that's from Word Tech Editions. Um, Lester is the poetry editor of Rosebud Magazine, a founding member of the Los Angeles Mayor's Poet Laureate Task Force, a board member of the Community of Writers, and emeritus member of the Westchester University Poetry Center Advisory Board. Um, you can find this book at wordtechweb.com. That's where, uh, that's where the book is found. And here he is, Lester Graves Lennon. Hey, Lester, how you doing? Hey, Tim. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. It's good to see you. I should mention, too, Lester is in our fantasy football league. And we are both the uh, the basement dwellers <laughs> the last few years. After some good runs, our good luck has run out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, Lester, do you want to start out with a poem? What do you want to read first? Well, it, I, first thing I want to do is to, is to thank you for uh, inviting me to come on. Oh, it's my pleasure. As soon as I heard you had a new book, uh, which was like a year plus ago, I, I marked my calendar to remind me to ask you. So uh, I'm glad it, it finally came out. And more importantly, the second thing I want to do is to thank you for all that you do for poetry. I mean, what you do with Rattle, the chapbook, the contest, the young adult outreach, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. And as far as I'm concerned, you're the hardest working man in poetry. <laughs> and thank you for that. Well, thanks so much. I appreciate it, Lester. Uh, it's always nice to hear. Um, so, so... Uh, do you want to start out with a poem? What do you want to What do you want to start with? Well, you know, I'd like to start. I, I like to think that a haiku counts for at least uh, two haikus count for at least one poem. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to start out with um, a haiku I wrote for my wife during. Uh, you know the real, the beginnings of the, of, of the pandemic when everything was uh, was, was shut down, uh, shutting down. So, morning walk with you in time of plague. Morning walk, no masks. We keep our social distance. Sun and breeze, do not.
And then on that same theme of COVID and sheltering in place, our daughter moved to New York City at the end of March of uh, 2020. Hmm. And within two months, here comes COVID. And it really put a, a crimp in her plans. And she was feeling a little, uh, a little down. So I wrote her uh, this, this haiku. Shelter. Sheltered summer days. Longer, leafless, sheltered nights. My heart shelters you. That was two poem, two haiku from uh, from lynchings, postcards from America, Lester Gray's Lennon's newest book, and that must have been hard. I, I keep hearing that um, so many people were, um, you know, had just moved um, at that time, and and so how long was it before you got to see her again? I mean, that must have been really hard to uh, to you know be stuck that far apart. Over a year. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, I don't know, it's been a rough time for everybody. And then for her, you know, not being able to meet new people, I mean, the loneliness of that must have been hard. Yeah, I mean, the best thing about it, her best friend was a roommate, so that helped. Ah, okay, well, that's really good. <laughs> so uh, so let's talk about the this book, which is a, a very hard subject matter. This is something that I didn't know about, um, that, that um, you know, there were lynching postcards as a part of American history. Somehow that... I mean, that shocking fact um, was something I never knew about, that, that people would take photographs of lynchings and then spread them, um, you know, share them like, like memorabilia or something, or some kind of like exactly. terrorist memorabilia, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 except, you know, the, the, sometimes terrorists don't, don't understand how much of a terrorist they are. But yeah, they were, they were sent around, guaranteed by uh, the United States Postal Service. They were sold. As mementos, you know, you know, so if you missed it, don't worry. You know, we, 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 we've got some photographs for you. Yeah, and, and I read that it was uh, 1908 that the Postmaster General finally you know, said you can't mail these postcards. It made it illegal. And so, they, and of course, they stuck it in an envelope and kept doing it. Um, how did you discover this, and, and what made you want to write a book about it? Well, um, I came across... Uh, Without Mercy, which, no, I actually, I have it, I have it here, um, actually, Without Sanctuary. It's from 10 uh, Twin Palms publishers, uh, and it is a book of lynching photographs and, and uh, some discussion uh, information about about the photographs, and then then, then then there's some essays on 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 what was happening and why it was happening, and I looked at that, and you get this this combination of horror and rage, almost disbelief, but you really isn't too much disbelief because given our history. It is highly believable. And then you have these, you know, this, this visual evidence. And I wanted a way of deal. It was twofold. I wanted a way of dealing with it personally. And I wanted to see if there was a way of further getting it out into the world, what we have done, what we are surviving. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, with clarity, I think, comes uh, uh, an ability to, to move to a, to a road of, of healing. Yeah, one of these photos is on the cover. Um, it's just yes. such a striking photo. I mean, it, it's just shocking. And then looking at other photos, I mean, what stands out to me most probably are the, the children and, the, and it's the expressions on people's faces. Like it's a, like something to be proud of, like a picnic and, and kids are like, and some of them, kids are like laughing and just hanging out. Like it's, uh, I don't know. It's just shocking to witness history in sort of all its ugliness, you know, on in one image there. And so you, so you've taken these uh, these photos and turned them into poems. Um, um, do you want to do you want to read one of them? Yeah, let me um, let me start. You know, I like to 
I like to stay a, a little bit in, in control of what I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it and, and not just thumbing through. So let's go with uh, page 39, postcard showing the lynching of Alan Brooks. Okay. okay, postcard showing the lynching of Alan Brooks, March 10th, 1910, Dallas, Texas, photographer unknown. This is not a postcard from hell. No. This postcard has proper postage. This postcard guaranteed by U.S. mail, guaranteed safe passage, safe arrival, content safe. Scrawled message, token of a great day. Scrawled beside one cent Ben Franklin stamp behind picture of teeming downtown Dallas. Picture taken one Thursday, lunch hour. Picture taken, old Negro hanging beneath Elk's Arch. Old dead Alan Brooks stripped naked, beaten dead before he hung. Clothes snatched as trophies before photographer captured his photograph. They said he raped a three-year-old girl. They said courtroom justice was too slow. They said hanging was proper work. God's work was hanging body dark, helpful arrow drawn to body, crowd deep in front of camera, two in crowd look back, they have the father and son look. And here, I put that photograph on the screen too, this is, uh, this is the uh, postcard of Alan Brooks lynching March 3rd, 1910, you can see the two figures in the front. Um, so these are ephrastic poems um, in a way. Yeah. I mean, they're describing the photographs, and um, and this is the arch. You know, you see the arch and the uh, and, and those those two people looking in. You know, and and at the cameraman. Yeah. Um, and and you'll notice that uh, you know everybody at home will notice that style is the Lenin lyric, which is um, it, where I first heard of you. I kept getting these submissions that were Lenin lyrics, and I th who, who the hell is Lenin? What is a Lenin lyric? And so finally, I I think I asked. I, we published one. And I said, like, yeah. this is like the fifth Lenin lyric that I've uh, read. Who is Lenin? Where did this come from? Because there was nothing on, like, Google about it at the time. And, uh, and then he said, oh, Lester Graves, Lenin. And then, and then I, so I looked into your work, and, uh, and then uh, we ended up interviewing you on rattle number 50. Um, so so how, can you talk about, a little about that, the form? Um, what is the format, and how did it come to be, and, and, and why? Well, the form is, it's a... 18 line poem, three six line stanzas. And just looking at, for example, this, this, this Alan Brooks poem, uh, the key is the first word and the last word of a line are the same. So, for example, the first word in the Alan Brooks uh, poem is this, and the last word in that line is this. So this is not a postcard from hell. No, this. So it works its way down the stanza until it gets to the last line, the sixth line. And then there, the, wor the first word and the last word are not the same, but they are similar. For, uh, for example, beside one cent Ben Franklin stamp behind. And that's so. That's 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 basically that's basically that's basically what it is. Why did I do it? Because I wanted to create a form, and I wanted to, uh, and I wanted to, I wanted to obviously be something that hadn't been done before. And I always noticed that I got a charge out of my poetry and and other people's poetry when. The first word of a line and the last word of a line are the same. And I said, well, you know, damn, why don't I just try that for, um, 
a whole poem. And so I came with the eight. I came with eighteen lines. And here it's it's real hidden ego, because Lester Gray's Lennon uh, has 18, 18 letters in it. And if you look at Lester Graves and Lennon, they're all six 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 letters in each in each word. So anyway, uh, so with that, I at first I thought, you know, maybe what I'll do is I'll look at all old rhythm and blues songs, you know, like Temptations. And, and and do and do the last word in a line, and and see and see how that goes. And then I started doing it. And I said, well, you know, other folks have done that. So I wanted I wanted to do this, and I was going back to um, the community of writers of, at at Lake Tahoe, and I wanted to to bring a form that I could work on there. So that's how it happened. Yeah, well, I, I just love the fact that it was that conscious that you thought, oh, I want to have a form that will like outlive me kind of. And then and then you went and did it and you made a form. And this is going to be around for a long time, I think. I've seen many London lyrics over the years. Um, and I don't know, it's, it, it works really great for that that echo um, thing. And I've never seen anything else like it either. And um, and if you have to, I love the, that your name um, is in there too, because if you forget what... Uh, what length it's supposed to be, you can just remember Lester Graves Lennon and then you know <laughs> you know all the details too. Um I just love it. Let, let's hear another one, Lester. Okay. Um right after that is unknown. Unknown circa nineteen oh eight photographer unknown. Unknown. Hung body, exact date, unknown. Black body, once man hunted because black. Because something black had to die. Because light pole was there somewhere where rail yard light was needed for correct work. Where light was useful for checking tightening noose. For useless coon last used uselessly as next dead coon, properly hoisted to see properly, rope strung high over light pole's lone arm, rope stretching neck tautly, thrusting chin up, stretching head skyward, body part of pole, wool head blurry in camera's lens, railroad cars blurred, waiting cart, Horseless below body, waiting like guideless fairy traveling to God, like coat, trousers, white shirt wasting on corpse, coat useless to impress, shined shoes, slow shoes, useless, all caught, all hung, all seen, all left by all unknown who died unknown, somewhere unknown. Yeah, that's one of my favorite ones. That that echo of the of the unknown um, is just so powerful. So that's another Lennon lyric, unknown. And once again, we're reading poems from lynchings, postcards from America, Lester Graves Lennon's newest book. Um, so Lester, how did you um, how did you get into poetry? I mean, one of the things, the other reason I should I didn't have to finish the story, but one when, when I found out who wrote the um, Le- the Lennon lyric, um, I found out that you were an investment banker, and at Rattle we're always interested in people who um, aren't traditional poets. Like that's one of the things that we love. So if someone's like some you know has some other career, our ears perk up, and we want to kind of meet that person. Um, so how did you come to poetry through banking? I mean, that, that is, you know, you, maybe Dana Joya is sort of a corporate-ish poet. Um, there aren't that many banker poets that I know of. I don't even think we could do, have enough to do a tribute. So, so how did you get into banking and then how did poetry fit into that? Well, I was a poet long before I was a banker. I wrote my first poem when I was seven. And uh, it, it was actually published, to put that term in quotes, uh, in the uh, elementary, Columbus Elementary School uh, newsletter. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, do, I did a fair amount of, of reading. I can remember, you know, going into my parents' library. And there's 
Edgar Allan Poe, for, for example, or, or Longfellow. Um, and I do that reading. And I went through high school and it was kind of off to the side and I was doing other things. Then I got into college and it was, well, what? And I started back into poetry uh, in part because it was another way of having an identity. Hmm. You know, in, in track, one of, one of my identities was, uh, in high school, one of my identities was I ran track. And I was captain of the track team, except I hated track. Uh, but, you know, I was halfway good at it, so I did it. When it came to college at the University of Wisconsin in poetry, I loved poetry. And so it was also a way of helping me identify myself. So I'd walk around the union and I'd grab, grab friends. I'd say, look, this is what I've just written. And I'd say, oh, well, that's really good. So uh, that's that's how it it's it restarted and then i had the good fortune of uh gwendolyn brooks coming to the university to teach a class in poetry and i was able to get into into that class uh and you know you hear a lot of good things about gwendolyn brooks you don't hear enough because uh, she's a of course, she's an extraordinary poet, but she was a very helpful, extraordinary human being. And she went so far as to take this 20-year-old's packet of poetry and send it to her publisher at Harper and Row and say, you need to look at this, hmm. at this book. So that's, that's how I got into it, and that's how I stayed, I stayed with it. So when I became a banker, Friends would come to me and say, you did what? How, how are you going to be a, a banker and, and, and you're a poet? But it, it, it seems to have worked out rather well. <laughs> yeah, I think you mentioned um, that, that it, it sort of made you stand out, too, that you were the banker that, um, that had poems. You know, it, it was like it, was a, it worked for business, too. Wasn't that you in, the, in your interview who mentioned that? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's um, in, in investment banking one of the biggest things you want to do is to differentiate yourself. You know, and uh, when it comes to uh, to to uh, selling your home or buying a home, it's location, location, location. Well, I found in banking, it's differentiation, differentiation, differentiation. And there aren't many bankers in my business that can go into a meeting, go into someone's office, and leave a book of his poetry behind, and you you get remembered for that, and that's in so so that's that's another way of, of helping you to uh, to stand out. You know, some folks, uh, some of some some of my subject matter is not going to resonate with them. So you best know your crowd. <laughs> know to whom you're speaking. You know, I'm not I'm not leaving this this book with certain with certain treasures. And I remember I was uh, being interviewed for a job, and I asked the then state treasurer of, of, of California, Bill Lockyer, hey, will you say something to these folks about me? Um, he said, yeah, I will. What I didn't know he was going to say was, because they were headquartered in Tennessee, he said, he's a really good banker, but you guys should stay away from his poetry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, if anybody has any questions for uh, Lester, um, leave them in the chat windows, either on Facebook or YouTube, and I'll pass them along. But uh, let's hear another poem, Lester. Okay. Uh, this one's on page 43. Photograph of lynching. Pre-1915 place and photographer unknown after Robert Johnson's hellhound on my trail. There's a hellhound on his trail, hellhound. There's a hellhound on his trail, on his trail, a pack of hounds hunting him, fleeing their pack. Found by hounds, found by men, by camera found. Camera sees body slumped to its knees. 
camera sees what should not be seen, what must be seen. Murder, eye socket, bullet blackened murder. Wounds where ears once heard hellhounds chasing. Wounds from bullets hunting groin, close range. Wounds from bullets exploding mouth to blood blooms. Bullets found target leather bound to pine trunk. Found bound hands useless to prevent its lead hounds. Hounding of helpless flesh tethered for hounding. Kneeling once black man looks bound black man kneeling. Dark brown head looks left, lost, sees something dark. Low scrub plains, endless show plantation, low. Background, two white men sit in carriage. Background, well-dressed, erect, ensuring all goes well. And that was another poem from Lynchings. That was a um, photograph of lynching. Um, and so it, we were going to do this interview, or we thought about it at first on uh, Martin Luther King Day weekend, but then we weren't sure if the book would be ready by then. But it turns out to be um, a good good timing anyway, um, because with the um, we talked before about Holocaust Remembrance Day and Mouse um, being being banned from the Tennessee school board or whatever that was. And Mouse is about the generational trauma of the Holocaust. And, um, and, and, and how that, you know, propagates through generations. And, and that's, in a way, I mean, this, this book makes you think about that, about how, you know, it wasn't that long ago, and, and your family grew up in that era, um, and, and you did too, because the, the lynching era didn't end until the 70s. Um, so, so how much, we talk on the show a lot about how, how one of the things poetry does is help heal. Um, do you feel like the poems, like going back through this, um, sort of helped? Do, do, first of all, do you feel that sort of generational trauma, and um, and do you do you feel like there's a healing aspect to writing these poems? Well, you know, there 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 are all kinds of lynchings. Uh, some accurate described as as one like like Clarence Thomas calling his his clearing a, a, his uh, Supreme Court justice hearing a, a high tech lynching which actually swayed it to him. Hmm. Uh, but I, there's a way, I, I mean, George Floyd was a lynching. And it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a slow motion lynching. And there's a direct line to someone being strung up on a light pole to someone being, being, being placed face down uh, with a man's knee on his neck slowly taking his life away. That's a lynching. Um, so that kind of clarity is needed. And, uh, and, and, and that video that you can go back and look at as long as you want and help to understand what the hell that is and how it still continues. And so in the same way, you can go into these poems as you will for as long as you will to get an understanding from one perspective of what of, of what was in a in a way of trying to uh, to ensure that it doesn't continue to happen mm -hmm. you know so this this uh, this mouse thing in tennessee it is highly disturbing because it's if you want you want to 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 walk away wipe away what happened and if you wipe away what happened like that you 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 increase the odds of it happening again mm -hmm. yeah for sure um and I, I can't help but think about the contrast at least from you know from passing around postcards pridefully and and trying to f you know frighten people with them which is what the postcards were doing to um you know i think the vast majority were just you know in shock and horror at seeing the images of george floyd i mean that was one of the most horrific things to witness um the you know the callous indifference there of that um and so you know i mean you know it's a marker post maybe along the way toward healing um is it possible yes 
Absolutely. Well, it's it's our choice. Mm -hmm. It's our vision as to as to what it's going to be. Currently, it looks like it's it, it's headed in the right direction. Yeah, you know, but maybe since we've I've brought up George Floyd, I'd like to read a a poem that reminded me so much of George George Floyd, except it was I mean George was horizontal and this and this was vertical. So there is the lynching of Reuben Stacy, and it's on page fifty nine, uh, and it. It, it, it speaks to them. The lynching of Reuben Stacy, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, July 17th, 1935, photographer unknown. And there's an epigram. The question of race in America involves the saving of black America's body and white America's soul. James Weldon Johnson. Children. It is the children. It is children looking up. Three girls, white girls, standing, looking. Oldest, tall, blonde, could be 14. The oldest, fingers on chin, appraising the rope's fingers, squeezing its claim, its calm insistence, squeezing breath until Reuben Stacy did not breathe. Farmer without land, without work, not farmer. Homeless, patched overalls, found hungry, homeless, hands cuffed in front, Reuben's large, handsome hands. Hoisted, crowd rushing to kill. Quickly hoisted, not, not skilled knot, not proper hangman's knot. Strangling until neck gave or air cut. Strangled. Seen, how much seen, how much draining life seen. Life study, field trip, observes lynching's life. Adults nonchalant, children now adults. Only children staring at body, only them. A fourth, smaller girl stands back from them. Cute, too cute. Shirley Temple, schoolgirl, cute. And that was lyn the lynching of Robin Stacy. Once again, from Lynching's Postcards from America. Um, I had a question here, sort of going back to the um, um, being in a banker. Um, Dick Westheimer asks, how has underwriting and banking informed your poetry? Are any of your poems directly derived from your experience as a banker? Uh, some. And it's interesting because a lot of the poems I do are in, are in form. But... The form, uh, the poems I have done that directly relate to banking are basically free verse. I can read one if you want. It's not, it's not on the list here, but, but, uh, uh, but, he, but yeah. So it, how does it? Creativity is open. It can go anywhere. It can go into poetry. It can go into banking. It can it can it can help uh, solve how you get the beat right in a poem to how you get the cash flow right in a um, you know when you're trying to uh, to create a proper uh, structure for for financing. Yeah, it seems to me like it might manifest as sort of a pragmatism, like like the, I mean the way that you created the Lennon lyric seems to me. Um, a part of a, a banker type thinking of like, I could invest in this and there'll be a payoff if I structure it properly. <laughs> you know what I mean? That seems well, like a, yeah. Payoff's long coming, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a, there's a um, spiritual payoff or something for sure, even if, it, it, uh, even if the checks aren't rolling in. 
Um, do, do you want to read that poem? I'd love to hear. It'd be a good contrast with a free verse poem um, compared to the yeah. Lenin lyrics that we've heard so far. You know, here's here's what's so, I guess we're, we're right with, with the universe because I turned directly to the page accidentally, <laughs> but maybe it wasn't. Um, this is the poem I actually, I wrote some time ago and I read it to a friend of mine who's also a banker. And he said, man, you can't, you can't, you can't publish this while he's still alive. And, and that's true. So I didn't, but he, he died. Uh, the person in this poem died about uh, maybe two years ago. So then I felt free to, uh, you know, to, to put it into the book. And it's, look, none of us are perfect. We all have our imperfections and we move forward with them. And this is what's happened here. So, Crumpled Socks with Lunch. Uh, what page is that on? Oh, I'm sorry, 109. Okay, thanks. Crumpled socks with lunch. Dark blue and crumpled under plain black suit. His socks are slumping past bare ankle tops. This white man who so clearly does not care. Could not possibly care with socks crumbling so carelessly like his eyes mumbling gaze towards the little colored balding man who smiles with yellowish small squares of teeth. I love the money, he grins, love the green. He knows this gray man making small meal millions each year will not give him. Not him who has mortgaged his home to start his business. Just a taste at best, but not enough to force those blue socks straight and the hungry Negro man's black socks are very, very straight. And I was crumpled socks with lunch from lynchings. And I, and I, and I, I remember uh, he, was, he, was, he was my boss at the time. And I remember when he said, I love the green. Uh, I love the money. I, I think, oh, I wanted to go. I wanted to hide under the, under the table. But, you know, <laughs> is, it is what it is. Yeah, so so um, I know that's free verse that that feels like free verse, you know, and and you're known for a form as a formal poet. I mean, you're, you're definitely drawn in that direction. Um, how does uh, how does the decision to write in free verse versus um, versus forms like the Latin lyric or, or other forms influence the way you write a poem? Like, and why do you choose one one or the other? I I think the subject chooses the chooses the uh, the form. Um, I, I remember when my, um, my father-in-law died and I, I really respected the man and I was working on a poem to read at his, uh, at his service. And it, it was, what, how am I going to do it? What am I going? And the only way that it came out was, uh, in free verse. It, 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 it wasn't lending itself to, a sonnet or a linen lyric or a Geigen. It was this and it and and so it it fit. But then again, you have to rem no, you don't have to remember because you don't know. So I'll tell you. Uh, the first 20, 25 years I wrote only free verse. I only got into uh in, into form uh, the the end of the 90s. Hmm. So, you know, maybe I've been writing uh, predominantly in form, you know, since 1999, something like that. What, what do you think drew you to form? Um, I wanted to understand it. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of like jazz uh, and, uh, you know, free form in jazz. And it's something that you can go to and just, and just play any damn thing and say, yeah, this is free jazz. But I think it's best if you have an understanding of what 
of what jazz is. I mean, what the blues are, what form is, who's doing what and why they're doing it. You know why Charlie Parker was such an innovator because he was coming out of a form and in coming out of it, creating a, a different form, uh, helping to create bebop. Uh, but, it, but then some folks would just go and crash down on the piano and say, yeah, this is free form. No, it's not. You don't know what you're doing. So I wanted to, to if I was going to do free verse, I wanted to understand what unfree was. I wanted to have a deeper understanding of what a sonnet was what blank verse is. And so I started studying in, and Westchester University had a form and narrative uh, conference that they did every year. And, and Dana Joya and, and Mike Pike were instrumental in setting that up. And so I would go there and I would take these classes and I would sit in and figure out, oh, this is a narrative poem. Oh, this is, this is, this is how a line is, um, you know. I mean, uh, Tim Steele uh, uh, sitting sitting in in his workshop. Well, what a line is, what blank verse is, what a feminine ending is. It's it's. It, 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 I was drawn to it, and it, it it made sense to me. Is the Lennon lyric that that does that have any um, line length form? Is there any meter to it, or is there any uh, syllabic? I, I was trying to count, and I and sometimes it, it feels like there is so often that it's hard to tell. <laughs> well, for me there is, but that's just me. It doesn't have to be as long as you got eighteen lines, three six line stanzas, and the first word and the last word are the same. You can do what you want. I mean, your line could be me me. Uh, if you want, I mean. Uh, it's that's why it's so open. And I know, um, for example, uh, Brenda Hillman teaches teaches it uh, at um, St. Mary's College in uh, in the Bay Area, and and she says her students, you know, really um, um, react to it, really really like it because it it, it affords you a great deal. A great deal of uh, of freedom, but for me, I happen to use blank verse. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and one of the one of the um, one of the lynching poems uh, I'll, I'll read later. It's 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 actually a sonnet. Uh, and then I can get really fancy. I remember when uh, when uh, our daughter graduated from from college, and I wanted to do something something extra special. So I did, um, I did a, a Lennon lyric in, in, in rhyming couplets. Hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's just a great form for that reason. Like the sonnet, it has, you know, a perfect amount of, you know, freedom, but then constraint at the same time. So it lets you sort of play off of that. Like, I mean, you can't play a game well, unless there's certain rules, you know, if you're too free, you're too free to do, you know, you can do anything. And it's just a perfect kind of balance, I think. Do you, do you want to go ahead and read uh, another one? Uh, sure. Let's see. Well, you know, why don't I read the 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 one I just talked about? That it, that is a linen lyric, but it's also but it's really a sonnet. Uh, and that is page fifty-one, Frank Embry. Okay. Frank Embry. Standing on buggy, facing camera, Fayette, Missouri, July 22nd, 1899, photographer unknown. He's a lynch knot waiting to tighten. He's standing on buggy's bed, backbone tall, standing, hands, genitals, last guards, cuffed in front, hands, wrists, swollen. Handcuffs, biting, captured wrists. Hats, bowlers, straw, soft brim. White men wear hats. Hatless, black Frank. No listed crime, just hated. Torso, too strong. Camera sees fear of torso. Elegance, brutally bound elegance absence of smiles no smiling just smiles absence flow 
of fresh welts slant down chest as they flow. Band, hats band, white face half in frame with hat band, hand low, face shaded, holding the whip hand. Thighs show whips map, whips slashing claim on thighs, eyes, mouth near snarl, frank embries, unbowed eyes. And that was Frank Embry standing on buggy facing camera. Another, uh, another of the poems from lynchings and, and a photographer unknown again. One of the things I read was that, that most of the photographers were involved in the lynching. I mean, that's kind of, they're behind the camera too. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, there's a question here. Um, I don't know if it's almost a rhetorical question maybe, but Diane access, do you think one of these postcards could be sent today? No. Well, I think they could. I just think it would be a it would be a hate crime and a you know national outrage, and we'd have a manhunt to try to find them, whoever was sending them. And, and given all the technology, I think maybe we would. Um, and maybe well, but, just I mean, the yeah. But you don't you don't need to now. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I mean, I mean that's. I mean, you can you can you can post it online you can uh, you can you can you can send it to friends you don't have to use so i guess my answer is is specific to to the u.s mail no but uh, in, in agreement with you yes you can still send it and i'm sure they are mm-hmm. yeah um so you, you talked about um you know you, you've mentioned a you know, the Westchester conference and things like that. You're one of the poets who has a big network of poets around you. Like you're a, a, a main part of the community, really of, of a certain more of the formalist, you know, around the Westchester conference and in the, um, um, the Squaw Valley writers conference too. I think you go to, um, you're just very active in the community. You're on the board of various places. Um, is there a reason that you do that? Like, like why, what motivates you to be such a good literary citizen? I guess I should, should ask. Accidental. Um, it's, I love what we used to call the community of writers of Squaw Valley. Mm -hmm. Now we do the Valley, but um, so much of my work has been done there. For example, each of the poems, each, each of the title poems in, in, in my new book were started, um, in the Valley, uh, I mean, when I first went there, it must have been 1999. And this this is the lineup of the poets that I got to work with on a daily basis who were, who were leading workshops. It, Bob Haas, Galway Cannell, Sharon Olds, Cornelius Eady, and Lucille Clifton. My God. I, I I mean I mean to be Lucille Clifton to be I mean to be in in that company Jesus I mean it was it was something and it just it, 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 it was always very renewing to be able to go there mm-hmm. of that group of people who do you think you you learn the most from is there anybody that that you sort of felt a kinship with and, and you learned and developed as a poet the most from their their advice. That's a tough one because they're all good, but you're forcing me to choose. <laughs> and uh, it's it's almost a toss up between uh, Lucille and Galway. I'd say Lucille. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, she was, she was extraordinary. I mean, she, uh, she had a way of, of, of giving a way of, of being able to include everyone in a, in, in a strong sense of positive, uh, in a strong sense of, of a positive collective. Um, two, two points. I remember 
a woman broke down when she was reading her poem in the workshop. And people were just, oh, just like no one did anything. Hmm. And Lucille said, in my workshop, we do not leave anyone alone. Hmm. And that out, you know, for the time for folks to reach out and reassure. And so that was, that was one Lucille moment that I remember. And another, I had written a poem and she didn't agree with the terminology, what I'd said. Now, I, and I don't remember it exactly either in the poem I had, I had said nigga or I had, or I had cursed and, 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 and um, she didn't think it fit. And she, and she said something that's always stayed with me and I, and I tried to apply to my, my poetry, which was don't add to the chaos. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So, and then she was kind, kind enough to write a blurb for my first book. You know, <laughs> and, you, know mm-hmm. you don't get National Book Award winners doing that often. Yeah, the idea of adding to the chaos. I mean, I, I love that expression. I mean, just thinking about what poetry is doing is making order out of how complicated yeah. and confusing life is. And so if your poem is just adding to that chaos and confusion, then what good is it doing? Right, right. Yeah. I, I mean, there's, there was one poet I, during the, uh, during the uh, pre-riots in, in Newark was talking about get rifles and go out and do this. And that's adding to the chaos. Mm-hmm. And, and, and he was a much better poet than that when he wasn't. <laughs> Well, I, I lost track of how many poems we've read. Do you want to read one or two more? Are there well, two you want I, to read, or, or do you want to just? I'd like you know, to. I'd like to read because I want to talk one. a little. I want to talk about Rosebud too. So I don't know if, if we want to do two more poems or just one more. All right. Well, let's do let's do one more, and and if there's time later, we can do it. You know, there's always. So what I wanted <laughs> okay. to do is, um, the Lauren Nelson poem page 59, because that part of the photograph is the cover for the book. Mm. Um, but we don't, the, the part that's left off is the son also hanging on that bridge uh, closer to his mom. Uh, so and this is interesting also because the photograph lists his name. So anyway, um, photograph of lynching of Laura Nelson and her son, L.W. Nelson, 14. Okama, Oklahoma, May 25th, 1911. Photographer, G.H. Farnham. Justice, old school, bright as day on bridge, justice. Smile, everyone, dads, mothers, Children, smile. Great day for Okama, posing on Great Steel Bridge. New bridge near Darkie Town. Hard steel weight, strong steel. Scores on top over dead weight. Lazy day, lazy sun. River flows lazily. Bodies, too, mother and son. 14. Bodies hanging. Screams stopped. Who's stopped first with hanging? Rope. Half inch hemp. Sun clearly shows sun's rope. Sun's trousers nearly off cling to feet. Sun's body twists right. Head back facing mom's body dress plain intact despite jail rapes undressings copyright 1911 copyright claimed bottom left on print bold letters claimed lined on their bridge above their trophies lined citizens pose for history as citizens laura Nelson's rope 
fades into print. Laura glides over water, leading sun. She glides. And that was a, a photograph of lynching of Laura Nelson and her son, L.W. Nelson, 14. And this is the cover photo um, from the book. And, and over, if you look up on the internet, over on this side, her son is, is on the bridge, too. Um, uh, Richard Westheimer again asks, um, or, or points out, he notes that um, it seems that there are almost no pronouns in these poems. And that was something I've been noticing, was that... Um, that in articles too, it seems very stripped of any of the the sort of. Um, it feels to me like each word is like a stone dropped into a bag or something. There's like a heavy, solid clunk, clunk, clunk. You know, without without a lot of things around it. Is that something that you do consciously, or can you talk a little about about that style? Because that was something that you can't help but notice, and it's very very distinctive. Yes, uh, it's. I want compression. I want as much as I can to get to the heart of something as directly and creatively as I can. And because because you have the first word and the last word of the line, because they are the same, you can't you can't do too much messing around with the and uh and uh, you, you have to you have to have the compression. And 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 that's what I love about poetry is poetry is really com- is really compressed language uh, that still has that still has meaning. Uh, so yeah, it is. It is. I didn't realize it was pur- purposeful until I started singing. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Um, so since the last time I talked to you, um, which was before the pandemic. Um, Right, you know, right before I think the fall before the pandemic, you were starting out as the poetry editor of Rosebud, um, and you were asking me about what my experience editing is like. Um, and now you, your first issue is about to come out, I think, right? Um, so- well, the, the first issue with me as editor came out. Mm-hmm. The, the the second issue was supposed to have come out uh, in uh, October, November, but COVID and supply chain issues have uh, stopped that and so it won't it won't it will slow it down so it, it won't come out i believe now until february yeah so so what is uh what's your experience been like as editor i mean how how does that reading submissions how has that experience been for you and and what are you looking for i mean most of the people listening are, are poets too and want to know, you know, first of all, how to submit to Rosebud, but also just what an editor thinks about, besides me, <laughs> about a, about how, you know, what you're looking for in poems and what the experience of reading submissions has been like. Well, I, I like diversity of all types, uh, known versus unknown, gender, uh, uh, one's sexuality, age, um, all of that, race. I, I want to, to, to be as diverse as I can. Yeah, in the first, in the first, um, and also maybe some folks who you don't really know were poets, but actually are. For example, in my first issue, I had um, uh, Bob Haas, uh, gave us gave us a poem uh luis rodriguez gave us a poem as did um our, our current los angeles poet laureate uh, lynn thompson pre being poet laureate so you know we were we were ahead of that curve uh and also andre de shields the the uh, tony award winner at hades town he he gave us a poem and that's an interesting connection because I talked about uh, Gwendolyn Brooks's class at the University of Wisconsin some 50 years ago. Two other people were in that class. Well, actually three if we, talk, if we count the woman that became my girlfriend. Um, there was Rod Clark, who is the publisher of Rosebud, and Andre de Shields, so we were we were all in that 
in, in that class. And then when it came to the first uh, edition where I was the poetry editor, you know, uh, Rod had asked me, his poetry editor had, had retired, he asked me if I if I would. And I said, yeah. And Andre was one of the, one of the uh, poets I, I, I went to to ask for uh, a work. And it was interesting because the work he provided us was a, was a poem that he wrote in the time of AIDS. And it was dating in the time of AIDS, if you think that was the title. And uh, it, it's so, it, so you had that dating in the time of AIDS being published today. And folks are kind of going through that now with dating in the time of COVID. So it was, uh, it was a nice... Uh, uh, the, there was a nice symmetry there. Uh, so, so what? Um, just if you're looking at a poem and deciding to publish it, um, are, are there certain things that make a poem work versus not work for you? Like, are, are things that you're noticing that you wouldn't have noticed if you weren't an editor? Um, you know, does it inform your own poetry in any way? In that in that way too. Hmm. I go for. I just go for what grabs me. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing I don't do as an editor is say, "Yeah, we'd really like to publish this poem if you change, you take out this stanza, or if you, or if, or if you rework it here." That's 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 not what I'm doing. And mm-hmm. when, you know, when you to me, you you've given it when when you submit it, you've submitted it, and that's what it's going to be. So I'm not I'm not doing that. But uh, poem poems that that grab me, maybe it's the first line. Maybe it's the last line. Maybe it's the you know. Maybe it's just just the style. I mean, I love that that uh, erasure style that uh, you know your 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 poet last mm-hmm. last was was doing. That was oh my god, it was 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 really something. So I'm thinking of maybe I might want to do an erasure poem, but I I haven't yet seen something that I would say. Well, I'd really like to to do that. We are we're publishing a, a, a poet um, uh, Breezy Janae who who uh, won who won the award from uh, she won an award recently, and I I, I first heard her. At, at, at Lake Tahoe, and she wrote a poem there in a workshop, and it was called "Ode to the Motherfucker Who Stole My Shit." And I said, "Oh my god!" And and that's the poem I wanted, but but she had promised it to someone else. So we're publishing another one of of her um, of her poems in the, in this uh, it, another one of their poems in in this. Um, in, in this edition that's that's coming out so i like to get folks who are, are really good but you might not have of have heard of them and then of course you know we've got uh, forrest ganza the pulitzer prize winner he's he's, he's given us some some uh, uh some work and uh, and tim Steele has given, and and dave mason so you know mm-hmm. we, we, we uh you like to is, is there a way uh, to submit to uh, to Rosebud? Is there a website that R- you should plug? R- net. rsbd.net. Go there, and um, there there's a way of uh, of submitting. Great. Well, um, let's hear. We're pretty much out of time. Do you want to finish out with one last poem? Um. Yeah. Can I do one that's that's not a lynching poem? Yeah, yeah, whatever you want to do would be great. All right. Let me let me go with the opening poem in the book. Uh, and it was, uh, well, in, in a sense, it is a lynching. Uh, but under church roof. Well, you know. I'm supposed to talk a little bit about these poems before before I do it. So let me just say, this is this is the, um, you know, this is after uh, the slaughter at, at Mother Emanuel Church, and I remember I was in Lake Tahoe, 
and I was writing this writing this poem, and and on the TV was Obama, uh, as as part of the service at, at Mother Emanuel, and he, you know he broke into his uh, um, his song on the church roof. Churches in blood is old news. Our black churches exist for solace in spilled blood, exist to provide Christ and sanctuary, to structure equality of color, structure embrace of all who Bible study, embrace rough young man lost in hunt under church roof. One witness left to tell the worst of one. No screaming audio, no, please, no, no last calls to Jesus as nine bled their last. Slaughter stained battle flag flies after slaughter. 45, birthday gun of 45, targeting beloved icon, hates best target, justice, Black churches were built to find justice not found outside the church, where white noose, not courts, held sway, where night riders were the courts. Mercy, the murdered in prayer found no mercy. Hatred is merciless. Church forgives hatred under the vault of heaven, all go under. Yeah, it's such a great last line. Or the vault of heaven, all go under. Um, the opening poem to Lynching's Postcards from America. Uh, Lester, thanks so much for being a guest. Just wonderful talking to you. Good seeing you after, you know, all the pandemic, um, you know, haven't had any events, things going on. Um, it's just wonderful to talk to you and, and share these poems and your, and your great writing style. I just love the way you, you go about a poem. Well, thank you. And, um, I'm already studying for my for next year's fantasy football. <laughs> yeah, well, we yeah. we got to do something different. I don't know. I don't know what the secret is, but uh, we were both in the in the you know the the playoffs the first few years, and, and now we're uh, we're at the bottom of the the chart. <laughs> so, I don't know, injuries kill me. I don't know about you, but anyway, thanks thanks, Lester. It's great talking to you. I hope to see you soon. All right, thank you. Bye. It was Lester Gray's Lennon, and um, and again, once again, his book is uh, here lynchings postcards from america that is from word tech editions and you can find the book at uh, their website which is wordtechweb.com that's word tech t-e-c-h web.com um, slash lennon underscore postcards if you want to find it the whole way but you can you know find a link there and um, and that powerful cover and a bunch of powerful amazing poems by lester and you can also find his web or, uh, Rosebud magazine, which we talked about, at rsbd.net. And uh, I'll put that on screen, too. This is Rosebud magazine, um, which Lester is the poetry editor. There's a copy of it. And actually, I looked at submissions. I should have asked him about this. Um, but the submissions are all through the mail. Um, so so uh, Smith Poetry 2, Rod Clark here at Rosebud magazine. There's a P.O. box in Cambridge, Wisconsin. And... Um, there you go. So so do check that out and check out um, check out Lester's newest book, uh, Lynchings, Postcards from America. His other books, too, are, are wonderful, too. So check all of those out. Now, um, let's see. We're going to go to open lines. And let me show you how that works before we do. Um, so if you have a poem to share, um, send that to um, open mic. That's open M-I-C at rattle.com right now so I can show it on screen as you read. Then choose one or the other. Either call it over Skype to be on video. Um, just send me a chat message on Skype to Rattle Poetry, all one word. Just type in Rattle Poetry in the search box. Say, hi, I'd like to read a poem. Then I will call you back within the hour. The other option is to do it by regular phone. The number is 818-850-7727. That's 818-850-7727. Just let it ring a few times, then hang up. And uh, then I'll call you back within the hour. And that is how it works. We're also going to be joined by uh, Roberta Beery, who was last week's uh, midweek poet um, with her uh, hyben. Uh, she'll be joining us from uh, from Ireland in, uh, at the top of the hour, I guess you say. Is that what you say? Top of the hour? Yeah. At, uh, at 11 o'clock my time, whatever that means for you. 
Uh, we'll be joining Roberta too, in addition to the open line. So stay tuned for that. And uh, I'm going to stand up and stretch. Hope you do too. If you, if you watched last week's episode, you know why. It's really good to uh, get your blood moving and, and prevent gl- blood clots. So um, you know, stand up, stretch, refresh in your drinks, and I will be right back in just a few minutes. Well, moments really, like 30 seconds or something like that. Here we go. And we're back. Thanks for your patience. Hope you got a good stretch. Um, what is this? Oh, this is the camera. I was wondering what that little blip on the side of the screen was. It's the other camera. Um, so this week's prompt was to write a poem with one word per line. Oops, here we go. This is this week. Write a poem with one word per line. That was this week's prompt. And um, and I, if, if you remember, I um, was a week behind. So I did a um, echo verse poem last week because it took me two weeks to finish it. And then um, last week's prompt was to write a poem that started with a question, um, and then the poem would be the answer. That was last week's prompt, but because I was doing the echo verse still, I didn't do that. I decided to catch up and do a um, a question poem, which was also one word per line. So it's the last two weeks combined into one. And how I got my question is I just typed in um, a question mark into the search bar of Twitter, and um, the first question in English, because it was like midnight last night. Uh, the first question in English that wasn't, um, you know, in, in Korean or, or other languages was this uh, right here. Um, hey, Dayton, do you believe in aliens? So that was the question I wrote. And um, it reminded me of the fact that I had kind of forgotten, uh, you know, me and Megan argue about whether or not aliens exist uh, or we used to. She doesn't think they do. Um, it was just a gut feeling for her. And I'm always like, well, look at the Hubble deep space, you know, f- deep, deep field photograph. There's so many galaxies, a billion, billion galaxies with a billion stars in each. You're telling me that there's no aliens. But the more we look, the less we find them. There's that that um, Fermi's paradox. So I don't know. But when I was a kid, um, I have a sleepwalking issue. I sleepwalk all the time. And I used to just wander the house at night. Um, you know, it comes from having low melatonin, so taking melatonin helps me not do it. But there's some kind of like thin veil between waking and sleeping when I'm when I'm sleeping, and I, uh, very frequently when I was like 13, 14, 15, I'd wake up outside, and my dad would be like, "Tim, wake up! You're outside again!" And so I'd have to, you know, sleep with clothes on. And it, even in the snow in the winter, he'd find me outside. And then I watched one of those unsolved mystery shows about um, alien abduction. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm abducted by aliens. That's why I end up outside. So that's what this reminded me of. And here is my, my, um, my one word per line poem and my question poem. And uh, this is it. This is, hey, Dayton, do you believe in aliens? Into this beam we'd walk, lost, arms bare, feet bare, even that moon overhead bald with its gray glow, face like God's blur into mist, only dark eyes know your star date, then that long fall back down into cold, soft snow. That is my beam me down, Scotty Pullman. For those just listening, um, each word is four characters, and so it's one beam down the page as well. So that is my um, uh, Do You Believe in Aliens poem. And uh, Megan has a, a real-life experience poem. This was, uh, I think, Monday, maybe? She went for a walk, and this happened. And she said, well, this was awful, but at least I got my poem written. And uh, so this is Megan's poem, Unleashed. Um, here it is. 
unleashed. I am taking a walk, feeling good about myself. I got dressed today, marinated my face in anti-aging potions, ate chalky non-fat yogurt for breakfast in any way. I'm here, aren't I? And then, 50 feet ahead, there's this tiny woman with two large Dobermans, and they spot me right away with that scary, alert posture dogs get, but they're leashed, I tell myself. So it's okay until both dogs bolt for me and this woman immediately loses her grip, falls over, watching helplessly as they charge me. I'm yelling, are they friendly? Over and over, no answer. I see her open mouth, a distant planet of surprise, and I'm thinking about how quickly the day got away from me, how the line between me getting dressed this morning or lounging in old sweats all day because we're all going to die someday is no different than the line between me and these dogs. It all depends on a woman who cannot hold on, who with all her night, all her might restrains her toothy, growling beasts and then lets go. That is her, uh, Megan's prompt poem this week and glad she was okay. I guess the, if she was not bitten or anything, so don't worry, um, Somehow she, the dogs kind of barked and then sniffed and, and somehow Megan's reaction didn't lead to an attack at least. Thank God for that. So, um, yeah, that was a prompt. And we have a lot of dogs in this town. This is like a dog lover's paradise. And they're, they're, they get out all the time and they charge us when I'm walking. And Megan doesn't walk the dog anymore just because so many unleashed dogs roam around and, and you know, when you have, yeah, it's a lot to deal with. Anyway, that is a great poem by Megan. Again, Unleashed. And that was uh, the prompt poem for uh, for this week. So let's see what you guys have. Um, once again, you can call in through the phone or Skype if you do. Two caveats. Um, make sure you shut off your screen, either X out completely or just mute because there's a delay. Um, so otherwise, you'll be confused. You'll be talking to me in one ear and past me in the other. And, and it's very dis- disconcerting and confusing to do that. Um, also have the poem in front of you to read separately from the screen. Because the because of the delay, you can't read off the screen because the screen is 30 seconds behind you. So anyway, it's like one of those old-time radio shows with delay. In this case, it's not FCC censorship. It's just uh, just uh, light waves bouncing around servers and, and the delays that that causes. But it's the same same principle. So let's see who we should do first. Let's do Nivedita because it's late in India. We'll call up Nivy right now. Hello. Hey, Nivedita. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great, thank you. How about you? I'm doing great. It's great to see you as always. How's your week been going? Um, same old, same old, as always. Um, and so you probably have two poems for us, right? Yep, you do. So what do you want to share first? Um, anything that you have up is fine. I have a prompt and a new story poem. So. Okay, well, let's, see. Well, let's start with the prompt poem. I have that right here. Okay, great. So it's it's basically a really small poem. I mean, I didn't write one as long as either you or Megan, but this was something that came through my head as I was traveling on the metro here. And I was like, this, this is basically what we do day in and day out. I mean, it took me this long to figure it out, but that's, that's literally all we do. So that's basically what I wrote about. Uh, you tell me whether you think it's true as well or not. Okay. An endless loop. Thoughts, words, actions, loop through to actions, words, thoughts, loop through to. This is the endless cycle we are stuck in. Follow, perhaps? <laughs> yeah, for sure. That is uh, that is the way. We think, we do, we do, we think. I mean, that's that's literally all we seem to do. That's that's basically life. <laughs> it, it is, it is. It's an endless, uh, endless loop of cause and effect and react mm-hmm. response. And yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Thanks for sharing that. And then what is the uh, the news poem about? So this, there's this new brilliant six-star luxury hotel that's opened up in, I think, Cape Town, somewhere in South Africa. I'm pretty sure it's Cape Town. And well, it's it's just amazing, the services that they have on offer, what they provide. It's, it's just brilliant. And the best part is that it's not for humans, it's for dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. There's a... Um... I can't There's get, always an ad. Yeah, I'm seeing if we can get to show some of it um, <laughs> before this ad. Well, it, it's a long ad. Let's just not. But but so this is an amazing six star dog hotel. You can kind of imagine what it would be like. I mean, how how they can pamper 
pamper the pets. Our dog is definitely not pampered in that way. But uh, let's let's hear it. Six star luxury. Go ahead. Six star luxury. The doors open to stunning marble floors and sparkling water fountains. There's even a sky deck that above the city soars and gives breathtaking views of Cape Town's mountains. The central lounge is where all the action's at, with comfy couches and plush throws. A walk-up cafe serves delicious treats, stat, and the residents are guided there by the nose. Be it for a couple of hours or a day or more, the staff here is sure to cater to every wish and make sure the stay here is super fun and never a bore. I'm sure you've never seen a hotel more luxurious than Swish. The best possible service you've ever seen awaits our posse and pals here. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for sharing that, Nivi. Um, six star luxury. Uh, just another. And apparently, the sky deck is something that is there. I mean, if you watch the video, they say it's it's like a central open courtyard with actual views of the mountain. So that's not something I made up. It's actually there. And that that and the lounge beds. Oh my God, the lounge beds are like <laughs> some of them are Superman themed, and they they look so comfortable. Like I haven't made half of this up. Half is my imagination, but half the other half. I mean, if you look at that video, like, oh, I want a bed like that. I just want to lie down in such a comfy bed. That's that's basically what it looks like. Yeah, that does. So, yeah. Yeah, we, if only we could be dogs and, uh, and hang out at the... Uh... <laughs> and I'm pretty sure dogs would be like, look at these humans. They have it so easy, so... <laughs> for sure. Well, thanks, thanks for sharing that, Nivi. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Tim. It's lovely talking to you. Have a great Sunday. You too. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Nividity Karthik with two poems. Um, let's call up. Um, let's call up Kathy Gibbons. Kathy hasn't been here in a while. Let's see what Kathy has for us. Morning, Tim. Hey, Kathy. How you doing? I'm doing. Very well, thank you so much. Yeah, it's good to hear from you. It's been a while, I think. Uh, what do you have that you'd like to share? Well, yeah, it's been a while because um, I've been having a little trouble writing lately. Uh -huh. and, um, and I was really grateful to you and Megan for the prompt because I was walking my dog thinking, one word, a line, I could do that. You could do that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it helped uh, to compress things a little bit. Um, and it's called Fullness. Okay, go ahead. I have it up. Okay, fullness. Drink solace, savor sadness, all flow forth from the same source. Oh, I love that. All flow forth from the same source. Excellent. And they, they so do. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Kathy. That's great. Well, thanks for having me, and thanks for the wonderful discussion. Yeah, love yeah, always my pleasure. Yeah. Okay, have thanks. a great day. You too. Bye. Bye. Ms. Kathy Gibbons with Fullness. And uh, let's call up next. Uh, let's call up Mike Bales. Good. How you doing, Mike? Pretty good. I have a P2 collective thing where we read acrostic po poems. It's kind of fun. Did that Thursday night. Oh, very cool. Um, do you, is that what you wanted to share? Uh, no, I wanted to share the news poem. I was going to share the other poem, but I couldn't find it. I could do it next week. I did a one-word-per-line poem, too. Um, this is my Poets Respond poem about the penguins. Ah, sure. So so why don't you introduce this? Uh, what was the article? Um, I think I might have first heard of it on public radio, but I researched it in different sources. It's that the Gen 2 penguin is moving further south, which is like further north in the northern hemisphere, and actually is on part of Antarctica because the ice is melted and it needs open waters. And it's a sign of climate change, and the, the article is calling, kind of calling the penguin the canary of about environmental causes. Mm -hmm. So for this, I'm going to call the poem The Ice is Broken. Maybe that's a better title than what I submitted to you. Okay, well, go ahead whenever you're ready. I have it have it ready for everybody. The Gen 2, its body sleek, swims from outlying islands to the edge of an ice shelf thinned on mainland Antarctica and on the shore of a channel where the ice is broken. 
He doesn't ask questions about climate, environment, or currents that flow as he searches for a shoreline near open waters. Through instinct, he finds a rookery to breed where he and his mate can weather their eggs until their offspring are set free. His young swim and dive, and each member of the family can catch their fill of krill and flourish, while others deprived of habitat diminish and die. True to his calling, he returns the next season for the love of place and bonded to his mate, while the world and tides change before his wary eyes. He builds a nest made of pebbles lying on the shore. Each stone he gives his mate as a sign of love, a ritual born in time. But for how many generations, he cannot know. Yeah, very interesting, important poem, too. Uh, thanks so much for sharing that. And what was the new title that you gave it? The Ice is Broken. I just crossed up the early one. I figured uh, I maybe you. that title's a little bit... They were seeking open waters, but the sign of environmental change is that the ice is broken, that there's further ice, mm -hmm. that there's less ice down there. Yeah, well, thanks so much for sharing that, Mike. That was uh, the, the Ice is Broken by Mike Bales. Thanks, Mike. Okay, thanks. Yep, bye. Okay, let's call up um, Jerry Stephenson. Hello, Tim. Hey, Jerry. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Yes, I am. I think, is this the first time you've been on? Oh, no, you've been on, on Skype before, right? No, this is the first time it's worked on Skype. Ah. My good friend, Cyril, said I got to quit being a whiteite. So I have been broadcasting for two weeks now. I'm using Zoom. I'm using this. I'm using that. This is the first Skype one, though. Oh, very cool. I think you have to click the camera button so we can see you, though. It's between oh, oh, the oh, that hang up and the mute. <laughs> the mute. Where is the mute? Okay, oh, right here. Yeah, toward the bottom. Is that the yeah. There, ah! yep, here you come. Here I there come. you go. That's Excellent. Nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good to see you, Jerry. Yeah, it's great. It's great. I'm glad. Uh, and you look, you got some sophisticated headphones there, too. You really go all out when you become, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm a gear guy in a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's, you know, Carpenter never blames his tools, but he sure likes a good set of tools. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So what do you have to share today, Gary? I've just got one for you today, okay? Uh-huh, and, yeah. and there's a reason for that, too. Okay. There's always a reason, okay? Mm -hmm. But uh, anyways, it's uh, your response, the one word one uh-huh okay and it's uh it's called possible okay yep here we go a great poem or any poem can be nailed with or enhanced with brevity uh, apologies i did use a question mark in the name and a period in the end <laughs> Excellent. Well, I love that. Uh, the quick cutoff. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much, Jerry. Hey, thank you. Great show again, too. Wow, yeah. Cool. Yeah. I, I loved it. And, and great seeing you, too. I'm glad you oh, got on Skype. Anyway, it's good to see you, too. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, take care. <laughs> yeah, Jerry Stephenson with Possible. Okay. Um, let's see. Who next? we got uh, 18 minutes until we have... Um, we have uh, we get Roberta Beery here. These are short poems, so I think we have a lot of room. If anybody else wants to call in, I'll put the numbers up on screen just one more time. Um, if they're right here, um, uh, yeah, there's uh, open mic at rattle.com if you'd like to share a poem, and then Skype to meet at Rattle Poetry or call me at eight one eight eight five zero seven seven two seven. So we have Philip Stern, Zachary Honeycutt, um, Richard Westheimer. Let's go to Richard Westheimer. Hey, Dick, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's good to see you. That was such a lovely interview. Um, yeah, yeah Lester is one of those good people in poetry that just, I mean, everybody loves him because, uh, you know, obviously you can tell why. He's just a great person. Oh, and when he started saying, oh, well, Lucille and Galway. <laughs> I'm going, Hold on just a second. Those are like very familiar names to you, aren't they? Yeah, for sure. Um, so what did you want to share today? Um, so I actually submitted two Poets Respond poems uh -huh. this, this weekend. If there's time, I'd read both. And if not, I'd read the one called uh, Near Dawn Before the War. Yeah, sure. Let's just do both. Because I think um, with the short poems for the prompt, I think we're going to have plenty of time. So, okay. Yeah, I was not I was not up to that one line. I mean, when I saw yours and Megan's one line poems, I thought, those really work. 
it was it was interesting trying to find a reason you know like i i thought at first i thought i'll just take an old poem you know you know make it one line and (laughs) but uh but if there's no reason it kind of um i don't know it was hard so so I'm glad I found that accidental question. And apparently that, that, that Twitter, they just ask every town if they believe in aliens. I don't know why. Um, I think they're trying to get Twitter traffic or something or, or find, I don't know you what know, they're doing, but, uh, but there's this whole string of, of towns and cities. They're asking if they, if they believe in aliens. So I don't know. Yeah. Not, not, not to be too uh, caught up on, on the words, but of course I'm, um, I am caught up on words, but believe in aliens and think there are aliens sort of have have two different <laughs> senses to them when you ask the question in two different ways. Yeah, they, what about you? Do you think there are aliens? I'm I'm mostly sure that there are, but I don't believe in aliens. Yeah. See, that's how I felt for the longest time. But I'm starting to wonder, you know, with a web telescope finding nothing. There is Tabby Star. I'm, I'm clinging on hope that 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 that's some kind of Dyson swarm around Tabby Star. But it's uh, just, if, the, I mean, when I say it's just math, of course, you introduce this notion that math can work in the other in the <laughs> other direction also, which I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I just wonder maybe if, if we're more of a, you know, our universe is some kind of illusion. You know, if there's no aliens, that's the conclusion, you know, that, that we're projecting yeah, so. or we're in a simulation or something, because otherwise there has to be. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson has a riff on that. Yeah. Uh, that possibility, which is really interesting. Anyway, so so which uh, which of these two do you want to do first? Yeah, so, let's start with near dawn before the war. Okay, and just real briefly, it um, uh, two things. One is I, I think I, a couple of weeks ago I read from Zimbroiska's mm-hmm. collection. I'm just her her poems sort of land so gently. You know, they, 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 they don't land with these really sort of like aha turns. And I've been thinking about how that works in a poem. So this was sort of an attempt to to do that. Um, and this is sort of in response to the uh, perhaps impending war on Ukraine's border. Mm-hmm. Um, so near dawn before the war, if and the epigraph, if civilization has an opposite, it is war. Ursula Le Guin. In the snow, a million miles away, soldiers shiver in the bellies of tanks, deployed across the border wire from others huddled in trenches. Some wear fingerless gloves and deal cards from a deck stripped of its lower ranks, twos and threes and fours, cast aside for some other gambit. The game they play is as old as Catherine the Great, Durek. They lay down cards until only one player, the fool, is left with any in hand. On both sides of the wire, cards are shuffled again and dealt again, and once again, the court cards always win, and the little pips are discarded, every game the same. Nearby, snow falls on quiet night quiet streets, In one home, someone pulls a loaf of bread from the oven. In another, an old woman scrubs pots and pans, her hands pruny and warmed by the dishwater. In a city not too far away, young clubbers stumble home at first light. A horn honks, a trash collector idles his truck and drags a metal bin across the pavement. A television flicks to life illuminates a frost-rimmed window on the 12th floor of a walk-up in a place named for a saint. A man unlocks his bicycle. Its chain ticks against the gears as he pedals down the street. Another man lights his pipe and reads the morning paper. A woman steals the last moments of dark to pull her lover across her night-warm body one more time before she dispatches to the border. A baby squalls for her mother's milk, another cries to have his diapers change. In a nearby church, a black-hatted priest intones matins, O Lord, save thy people. Back at the wire, on one side, the men huddled in the tank play one more hand. In the trench across the way, a woman collects her buddy's cards, quietly pockets the suicide king, and wonders, is she more queen or jack or pip? She pulls out a creased photo of her baby, kisses it, and tucks it in her boot. 
Dawn tinges the horizon. She shoulders her pack, checks her rifle, and heads out on patrol one more time. Yeah, great poem. It's hard to imagine, you know, that that, that happening, that, that that's happening right now, you know, on the on the border. I mean, I don't know, like a, like a full scale war with a country like Russia is. Uh, it's been well, a long and, time and, since. And, yeah. Yeah, and and it it struck me like there's always the a morning before the war breaks out and it looks very ordinary and you don't know which morning it is. Yeah. Um, and so that was sort of my thinking, you know, what, what is it like to be in one of these villages not too far from the front and just living your life? Yeah. Um, it, that'd be a, it'd be a tough way to live. Hopefully it, it resolves soon. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so what was, that was the other one about. Uh, I was called in, um, and somebody lay this book down, and it was a found poem. I read the transcript of the, of the uh, um, McMinn County, Tennessee school board considering Mouse, mm -hmm. and it was it was just really interesting to, to sort of encounter um, how these folks were encountering this chapter in world history. Um, the other thing that's interesting is this little county school has an entire quarter of the social studies year of their eighth graders committed to the Holocaust oh, study. Wow. Of the Holocaust. Hmm. So it's, it's not, it's like this story inside a larger story, which is it's, it's not just, these are benighted people with, with no sense that they want to teach this history. Mm -hmm. It's sort of, we have a disconnect from it. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. This is one of the poems that, uh, you know, it didn't get to the phase where I looked who it was. I didn't realize it was yours, but I was thinking about this poem this week. It's interesting. The found poem format. Um, so you go ahead whenever you're ready. I have it. Okay. And somebody lay this book down and it's this found poem. I don't, I won't read the whole epigraph there. Um, and the epigraph is there are no dangerous thoughts thinking itself is dangerous. And the reason why I thought of Hannah Arendt was her notion of the banality of evil. But I liked this take better. You see the naked pictures. You see the razor. You see the blade where the mom is cutting herself. You see her laying in a pool of her own blood. Please, somebody, lay this book down. Sure, we do the Holocaust, but we have processes and procedures in place here. We can tell the kids what happened, but we don't need all the nakedness and the other stuff. Can I lay that in front of a child? It ain't happening. It is not happening. It is like when you're watching TV and a cuss word or a nude scene comes on and you don't look at it. You don't look at it. Again, reading this to myself, it was decent until the end. Until the end, I really enjoyed it. I liked it. The end was stupid, though. It shows people hanging. It shows them killing kids. It's not wise or healthy. Somebody lay this book down and say, look, it was taught. Look, it was taught. Say, look, it was taught. And I was trying to indoctrinate somebody's kids. This is how I would do it. You put this stuff just so the vulgarity and the kids, they soak it in. We don't need the scene with the mice hanging from the tree. We don't need all the nakedness and all the other stuff. We don't need the curse words and foul language. I never had a book with a naked picture in it. I never had a book with foul language. So I vote to do away with the book. I vote to do away with the book. And somebody lay this book down because somebody will say, look, it was taught in the classroom. So, Madam Chairman, I'm going to bring this to a head. I started it. So now I'm going to bring it to a head. I move that we remove this book. I move that we remove this book. Yeah, that's just great. The voice in there. Um, I don't know. It brings it home in an interesting way. Have you read that book? I I'd never, you know, I have an aversion to graphic yeah. novels. I kind of hate graphic novels, so I've never even, you know, th thought about reading it. Um, yeah, we we read it. It was uh, we shared it with our children. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's a very very powerful because it is about it is about generational trauma. You know, yeah. it's not just about it's it's about how we inherit it, and that's a big discussion in the Jewish community. Is like. Do you define yourself by your trauma 
mm-hmm. or do you define yourself by something else? And so the, this book helps open up that discussion a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, hopefully, it'll it'll get more people reading it, like me. Now I really want to read it after hearing and reading well, more about it. You won't be able to find a copy, Tim, <laughs> unless you have a friend with one because it's sold out at all the yeah, online. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, that's great to hear, and that's the thing about you know censorship. The Streisand effect is great publicity. So, <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. Well, take care, Richard. Always a yeah, pleasure. Good, good to see you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. So Richard Westheimer with our two poems, and somebody lay this book down. The most recent of those two. And uh, let's go to... Actually, we have uh, five minutes. Let me do some random poems, I think. Actually, no, let me call it Philip Stern. We have time for Philip Stern. Then we'll call up Zachary Honeycutt after we talk to Roberta Beery. Hello. Hey, Philip. You are live on the air. Good to talk to you. How are you doing today? Good. Hold on. Let me mute you. Okay. Okay, is that it? Yep, it is. So uh, we're all set. So what do you have that you'd like to share today? Okay, I had a miss last week's uh, Rattlecast, though I did watch it later. Uh, so I have two prompt poems. Okay, great. Uh, I would, this, yeah. Yeah, this week's and the last, you know, on the question and the title. So which one okay, do you want to so start with first? I'll start with the short one, the singles. Oh. Okay, go ahead. Singles, looking for some suitable single words in column to sketch the lonely single woman also looking for suitable. <laughs> oh, very nice. I like that a lot. Thank, thanks for sharing that one. Um, another one that, you know, the, the four makes sense. I love it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, the other one... Um, Actually, uh, is well. The you know the prompt had me uh, revising, led me to revising a poem that I've been uh, revising <laughs> for a while, um, and uh, that and the fact that it was my birthday a couple of weeks ago. Um, so uh, a few weeks ago, I turned ninety-four. Uh-oh. So as usual. <laughs> well, happy birthday. So I, Okay, thank you. All right, so it's called So Who Will Mourn? Last Tuesday, I nodded to another year gone by. Now well beyond allotted three score years and ten, the old wonder number. And again, I wonder who will mourn when I am gone. My partner of a thousand years, of course, she of the sunny smile, who will cry and cry and cry and hopefully still play poker in the afternoons. Our two kids, of course, who will sit close together and tell funny stories, growing up grievances long forgotten, about some stressful class project now propped against dark basement wall, with its clean sentences and flashy pictures pinned in a glorious push on the last night on huge hinged cork boards. Or they may repeat scary, funny stories about skidding on black ice roads in ferocious snowstorms, singing upsy down town and other nonsense songs to the rhythm of the windshield wipers until arriving breathless and silent to their northern college. Sad, of course, but solidly grown, they too will go back to their homes and create funny stories for their own children who may well remember my pink or blue birthday balloons and vanilla icing cakes and chocolate-covered Easter rabbits and standing together, waiting wide-eyed in parallel maze lines for melodical, magical rides, so unlike the elevator drop at Tower of Terror, which produced screams first and then loud laughter. But of course, the children will go back to their classes and present laughter with their friends. Of course, my friends are gone except for one. We speak just once a month, and at our age, we live too far away to meet. I'm sure that he will reminisce and mourn unless he goes first. Will there be a student, perhaps, whose name I cannot remember, who might see my name somewhere and recall an English ode we read aloud in class 
a wondrous shape without sharp edges, that we all fed and watered together until it bloomed before our eyes, our ears, our hearts. In pastoral elegy, processions of fantastic objects mourn a poet who has passed. So will my idle pens, before they are fully drained and tossed, also march and mourn all the thoughts unfinished, the words unwritten? Surreal nonsense, of course, but still. Oh, excellent poem. Thanks so much for sharing that, Philip. Uh, that was So Who Will Mourn. Um, wonderful poem, and, and happy birthday again. It's great to hear from you. I'm so glad you oh. can be part of the show. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, Tim. And a great show. Love, yeah. love the reading. Thank you. Thanks so much, Philip. Take care. Bye. Bye. It's Philip Stern with two poems, Who Will Mourn, So Who Will Mourn, and then Singles, uh, the two prompt poems. Um, so it, timing is perfect. So let me go over and see if Roberta is here. I'm trying to find the right. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, so Roberta is here. Hey, Roberta, you are uh, live on the air here. It's great to see you. Let me get the... Uh, the audio adjusted. I haven't heard you yet. Are you? Uh... Can you hear me? Excellent. Yeah, we hear you perfectly and we see you perfectly. It's great to see you. Another poet who, um, you know, go way back with, but I haven't seen since before the pandemic. Well before in this right. case. <laughs> so I'm um, happy to be here. And of course, it's one of it's one of those days when the internet, you know, isn't working in Ireland. So I'm I'm using my phone, which is a first for me. So oh wow, well it works perfectly. You you look great, and and you're going to be the guest uh, in about one month. So looking forward to a full show with you. Okay. Um, but do you want to just describe what this poem? You know, what inspired this poem, which is kind of self-explanatory if you've read it. But um, um, when I read about Janice, I am I am the same, only different. Did you say Janice Ian? Janice Ian? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I, I'm dating I myself, but yes. Yeah. If she's listening, Tim, you're going to have to go stand in the naughty corner. I, I know. I, I Honestly, I meant to look that up before uh, before the show and forgot. <laughs> so. That's all right. I'm always amazed when... Um, I just think everybody in the world has heard of Janice Ian, you know? So well, I've heard her music. I just, um, you know... That's okay. I don't know. <laughs> It's all right. You're you're forgiven. So, um, I mean, when I when I read that story in the New York Times that uh, that Janice Ian has done her final album, and that now she's going to focus on writing her writing and among other things her haiku, I was just blown away because um, it's like you know how often does like your favorite recording artist, talk about writing haiku. So <clears throat> that really was the impetus for me to delve into the all those memories of when I first heard her music and to try to, you know, get other people to understand what that was like, especially people who weren't alive then and who missed, you know, the best era as far as I'm concerned when I was 15 or so, you know, in the yeah, late Yeah, I wasn't 60s. alive then, but I agree. That was the best era for music, for sure. I mean, <laughs> it was the best for everything, you know. It's just, it's just the kind of memories that really are so applicable today. And, um, you know, I, I feel like I can just deal with life a little better, you know, not only because of her music, but just because of the era that we, we lived through. So um, that's, that's how that came to be. And then, of course, Poets Respond is one of my favorite things and that Rattle does. I mean, I've, I've done some epic, epic fails for Poets Respond. So if anybody is listening and thinking, oh, should I submit or I submitted one time um, and I didn't get it. You know, every so often I meet these poets that say, oh, I submitted to Rattle one time and I didn't get it. And I was like, what? <laughs> When, when when I got that email from you saying it had been accepted, I, I like to go on submittable, you know, just sometimes to torture myself <laughs> and count up the number of times where I've submitted to something like Poets Respond. 
And uh, although my my general submission for for a rattle is quite high for me, I mean it's quite high along with all, all the rejections, you know, that come in red on submittable. Mm -hmm. I have one or two greens. And uh, but you can do this thing on submittable, which I didn't know. You can just like search poets respond, for example, oh, really? which I did mm -hmm. all your my long row of of <laughs> declines. They call it declined on submittable. <laughs> came up. So I I was showing this. Who would be interested in this except other poets? <laughs> you know? So so when people said, "Oh, you're so lucky," you know, you just hit it the, the right spot. I said, "No, actually, I have." Uh, this very long list, if you'd like to see, I can just send you a screenshot, you know, you just keep trying. Yeah, well, it's it's, it's one to 200 people every week who submit. And then, you, you know, it's, there's a lot to juggle and balance. And so that is a great point. I, I, I'm glad you bring up because, you know, if people just only sent once and then never sent again, it wouldn't work because eventually people would, there'd be nobody left. <laughs> so know, so it takes, it really takes people that, that keep going at it. So I really appreciate um, you and everybody else who submits miss frequently to it. Um, it's really, it wouldn't exist without that. And, and a lot of people don't seem to know about it. They, they just have looked it up on different sites, Rattle, and they think, you know, oh, it's got its low acceptance rate. But I told even people in my own haiku group that I've been in for like 20 plus years in the States um, that we do by Zoom now, I just told them, you know, there's so many things on Rattle that you can send into mm -hmm. besides the tribute calls and the general poems, you know, the, the, there's um, the Poets Respond and ekphrastic and you know you'll hear you'll hear back fairly i said you'll hear back within a week on poets response and you, you know and so hopefully um you'll be getting more of those and because i've been i've been more submissions like that and because i've really been spreading the word well i appreciate they do because the the haiku community we love to publish more haiku in in, in japanese forms and um there really aren't as many submissions as you'd think after we did that issue I um, mean, we publish you and other people sort of regularly, like Debbie and, and other people like that, um, you know. So, so yeah, from the Haiku community especially, we love to have more submissions. And don't take one rejection as um, as the, the final answer because it, you know, it takes a while to get in. But let's hear this poem. Do you want to go, go ahead and read it? Okay. Um, here we go. When I read about Janice Ian, I am the same, only different. Smoking pot in the cafeteria with my friend Susan, singing Society's Child, and I sing along, our matching flower shirts, like we'd stumbled into a field of buttercups and we're staring at a sky of blue butterflies. We don't see the gum stuck under the table because we're stoned and the teachers don't give a shit. And I want to be Janice Ian strumming a guitar. But today I have piano. And when I get home, Susan's in the backyard crying. And I sneak her into my room. And her married brother bangs on the front door screaming, you tell my sister I'll beat the crap out of that guy if he ever shows up again. And Susan and I hide out all afternoon playing society's child on my big sister's stereo. Careful, the needle doesn't scratch because she'd kill me. And when my sister beeps, we take the steps two at a time. And for once, she's nice and gives Susan a ride to her mom's. And the decades roll by and Susan and I lose track. But I send her my book anyway. And she calls and talks about the old days. And I tell her, Janice Ian says she's done with music and writes haiku now. And I am the same as I was that day in the cafeteria and different too, which is hard to explain. But after I find Susan's address, I pencil a paper with buttercups and three lines that say, rising from the pebbled path, blue 
butterfly. Yeah, that's just great. That was uh, Tuesday's poem. When I read about Janice Ian, I am the same, only different. Um, and I, I've asked, uh, I love that last haiku at the end. Um, and I always read, I have to confess, I always read the haiku first when I get a submission that's high. Because kind of, if the haiku's you know, not good, then there's, you don't have to read the rest kind of. It's a very good practice. <laughs> is, that, is that normal or is that is that frowned well, upon? It's, a, it's normal among editors that read uh, Haibun and understand what they're reading because if the haiku doesn't work, as a, to me as a standalone mm-hmm. haiku, you know, if it can be just a, a haiku submission on its own, then, then nothing's going to work. Yeah. The whole poem is not going to work. So, and when you get like a lot of submissions of high bun, as I imagine you must might have when you did that Japanese forms issue, and uh, it's just you know it's kind of <laughs> it's a shortcut. Not it's, a great thing yeah, <laughs> not, not many uh, not many poems come with a shortcut built in, but that's the nice thing about the high bun. Um, so well, I think what I mentioned though that um, Janice reached out to you and, and wrote to you. Um, Afterward, right? After she read this. Yeah, she, uh, what I did was, I'm not really on Facebook very much, but I do have a Facebook page. Um, and uh, on that page, I posted the, the link to Rattle with the, and the, then the poem comes up, you know, in the link. Mm-hmm. And um, I, t- I, th- I tried to, I tried to tag you, but I couldn't. But <laughs> So I tried to tag, R- I think I tagged Rattle and I tagged um, Janice Ian's uh, she's uh, something like the real Janice and and um, so I got some people, some comments from friends and some people I didn't know and then all of a sudden a lot of people I didn't know and I was thinking I don't understand and then I got messages to Janice and <laughs> in the comments uh-huh. and I thought what is this and then I saw um, Janice Ian said uh, I had said thank you for the inspiration to her in my comment And she wrote, thank you, Roberta, you know, and a couple of other emoji kind of things. So that, that just, that was the best, you know? Yeah, that uh, is really cool. And and it's, you know, people always find the the poems about them. It's interesting uh, throughout the poet respond, especially my favorite was um, Anthony Scaramucci. Do you remember that guy, that political figure? Scaramucci. Scaramucci. (laughs) So we had a poem about him and uh, one of his aides sent me a message and said, like Anthony loved the poem, <laughs> just a one line thing. I don't even know if that was sarcastic or not, but um, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway. And then he follows us, followed us on Facebook or, or Twitter after that. So anyway, but it's always cool to see that you know the poetry reaches places, and um, and hopefully Janice will send uh, send him. Uh, he starts publishing haiku. I hope so. I mean, I read, I did look on her page on Facebook since I'm able to do that. And, uh, and I did see some, um, she has some haiku up there from not, not recently, but I know she also said something about writing short stories and um, a novel. And since I've been also doing not the novel, I mean, unless you count one or two chapters, but I have been writing a lot of short fiction and, uh, you know, there's just maybe she'll start writing Highland and sending it into, you know, Poets Respond. Who knows? I mean, yeah, that, she that'd has be definitely such, cool too. <laughs> yeah, she has such a, I mean, her songs are, you know, they're so iconic and it's just still relevant today. And I know a lot of people, her other, her other song that I kind of sang all the time uh, back in the day was, um, you know, 17. And uh, that's one that I would uh, recommend also for the, for the, uh, she has a lot of diehard fans still, and that's great. And new fans too, because I could tell by the messages they were sending to Facebook thinking that, uh, you know, I was she and about how they love her new album. I love your new album, Janice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, hope, I don't know if she was still reading the comments, but <laughs> oh, that uh, really she's cool. got a lot of messages there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I just had a really good time with it. And, um, you know, it seemed to resonate among certain people that I never thought would even read it. So that's just anything to spread the haibun and haiku word, you know, that's one of my missions in life. And you, Tim, are such a good, um, good editor. You know, so many editors are closed off to those forms, but I know that because Rattle takes them, 
there those forms are now being taught in MFA programs, especially Hyben, mm -hmm. because as as Hyben editor for Modern Haiku, I get an awful lot of submissions from MFA students. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, I always and, feel like you know Rattle's mission is to to even though it's hard to do, is to get poetry in front of people who don't usually read poetry. And the high bun is the form that I think is one form that really works great for that because you get the prose and you don't have to feel lost. And then you, and then you get the haiku in the right sort of sense of like sort of wonder when you know what's going on. So it's a perfect combination, I think. But we can talk about this more uh, next yeah. month, which I'm really looking forward to uh, that, that rattle cast coming up. Um, and, and all your work and all your great work that you do for um, for championing um, haiku and haiban all around the world. So um, looking forward to that episode and uh, and talking to you to the then. Okay. <laughs> okay. Are we are we are we are we saying goodbye now? We, yeah, we are saying goodbye. I got to get back to the open lines and everything. <laughs> okay. And uh, yeah, but but thanks, Roberta. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Take care. Okay. Thanks for having me. Yep. Bye. Okay. Bye. So that was Roberta Beery uh, with uh, with two days, Tuesday's poem. When I read about Janice Ian, I am the same, only different. And um, I can't believe I said it. I am. I, I you know I, I assumed it's Ian, and then uh, and then I thought, well, what if it's not? What if I'm wrong? And that 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 other pronunciation crept into my brain. So uh, let's see. We have uh, Zachary Honeycutt. We have to get to still, and we have some other poems to read. Um, it's getting. It's called Zachary Honeycutt. Hey, Tim. Hey, Zachary. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing this good. morning. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. I was saying, yeah. Yeah, this morning. Yeah, tonight. Yeah, this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Need another cup of coffee, Tim. I do. I've only drank half my, half my coffee. Last week, I had two cups of coffee, and I drink espresso, mm -hmm. or like Americano oh, or whatever. And um, I was buzzed last week. So this week, I tried not <laughs> to drink as much. Um, but maybe I need a little more. So what do you have that you want to share with us, Zach? I'm, I'm a Maxwell man house myself, Tim. <laughs> oh yeah. But, um, <laughs> no, I, uh, I got a, I got a prompt poem. I got a mono poem. And, uh, if I have time, I have a couple other short poems I'd like to crank out if possible. Yeah. Too, let's do, uh, let's do the, 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 sh the single line and then one of the other two. How about that? Okay. That sounds great. Okay. Okay. So this is my mono poem. Okay. Go ahead. If I could be anything, I would be a word, a very beautiful word, one that makes people happy. Oh, that's very cool. I love the way that plays across the page. It's a little hard to read these, I've noticed, as you scroll, but uh, but that works really well. Actually, let, these are short. Let's do, the, let's do all three of them, actually. The next one's The Paradise Before Me. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome, yeah. So yeah, I uh, I just have some poems that I want to do just because I feel like it. And uh, these are like classic oldie Zachary Honeycutt poems. These are both about kind of like seeing God in nature and just the beauty and intricacy of nature. So here we go. The Paradise Before Me. Sitting in a rocking chair, wind gently knocking back my hair, with birds flying way out there out there by the horizon. The sun is feeling my hot sorrow. I have won the day, but not the morrow. I've done it all, but beauty borrow, out there by the horizon. And what I've beheld, I shan't put to rest. This prime portrait of creation can't be a mental test, for I do not regret seeing what God made best, out there by the horizon. I am so blessed that my memory can serve to replay scenes of nature that I don't deserve, but I'll be thankful for the quiet glory that awaits my humble reserve out there by the horizon. And if heaven is but a state of mind, then hell is the rut of being blind, for so many things majestic lie out there for all mankind, out there by the horizon. Yeah, excellent for the mix, uh, the paradise before me. I, I love your style always. It's always fun to listen to uh, that uh, that Edgar Allan Poe rhythm. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. <laughs> and then we have Ignorance of Heights, a sonnet. Yes, 
This is another rhythm poem here, if you like the other one. Ignorance of Heights. I see this tree with birds that spread their wings. I see some soaring, sailing, and swaying, joyfully thinking of jovial things. To me must be a grand game they're playing. As simple as sand lethargically swept by a crystal clear sea with crashing arms. As unthinking as time ticking unkempt, moving irregardless of looks and charms. Why do they get to frolic all the day? Why are they soaring so often and free? Whilst I am grounded so oft in dismay, itching and wishing to fray as they be. Wonder if they take for granted this state. Under a tree, there's just me and the weight. Yeah, I just love listening to that sounds, that, that pulsing rhythm you got going there. Thanks for sharing that, Zachary. Always a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, always a pleasure, Tim. Looking forward to this month. Yeah, yeah, me too. Talk to you soon. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. It was Zachary Honeycutt with uh, Ignorance of Heights, The Paradise Before Me, and the uh, the Mono Poem, which I think he just titled Mono Poem. Uh, let me make sure I didn't miss anybody. We have some people that asked me to read poems as well. And uh, Okay, let me look at a few poems uh, from the inbox. Here's a mono poem from Sharon Ferrante. This is Daytona Beach. Daytona Beach is my tool, my tracery, aimless wayward on sandy roads that blind me perfectly. Now I'm ready to learn things. I thought it was cool. Now I'm ready to learn things. I, I actually like this form. I didn't think I would. But um, there's a way that it, it, I don't know, like every every word has a weight, especially. So when there's a good little line, it works really well in this mono poem style. That was Sharon Ferrante, again, with uh, Daytona Beach. Um, okay. And then, um, let's see, Clayton Clark um, had to step out. She does something uh, halfway through the show. She, I know she usually steps out, but this is uh, two monopoems from, from Clayton Clark. This is Smoke Shop is the first one. Smoke Shop. Wildfire lights up the hillside takes a turn at the corner store. Oh, I love that. That's almost a haiku. And then birthday calendar. Gray-handed knight monkey on his date pulls my brother back into life. Very cool. I love both of those. Thanks for sharing those, Clayton. Those Clayton Clark with two poems, especially the, the a turn at the corner store. I love that from the smoke shop. Thanks for sharing those. Um, oh, Bev Wendell Atherstone wants to join. Let's call up Bev. We'll see if it works. Hey, Bev, how are you Hello. doing today? Hey, how are you, Tim? Nice to hear you. Yeah, it's great. I'm glad you could call in at the last minute here. So we have a, a one word per line poem. Is there anything you want to say about it before you read it? Well, I wasn't quite sure what was needed. I didn't know you could have sentences with one line, <laughs> oh, one word per line. But <laughs> but it's okay. It forced me to conciseness. So uh, So here we go. Okay. I called it Requiem, mm -hmm. and here's the poem. COVID, isolation, time, quiet, meditation, peace. Oh, very cool list. I love the, the isolation meditation rhyme stuck in there. Thanks for sharing that, Bev. Thank you so much. Lovely program today. Thank yeah, you. always a pleasure. Good talking to you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. That was Bev Wendell Atherstone with uh, Requiem. And Ted Guevara has a uh, has a poem for Natalie Wood, Rebel Splendor. This is Ted Bernal Guevara, Rebel Splendor. For that very water we speak of and doubt flows wide, and the girl who had fear for backbone swims alone there. See how that I love that how that you know every word has so much meaning when they when they go one at a time. It's it's similar to. Um, to Lester Graves Lennon's style, it sort of forces you to do Leather, Lester's sort of uh, the gravitas of uh, Lester's verse. So I love that. Who is uh, Natalie Wood? I'm going to have to look that up. Because um, I'm not familiar with that. Natalie Wood. Who's Natalie Wood? So it's an actress. Let's see. Hmm. 
I'm not sure. See, I, I'm very ignorant of very many things. You have to realize I live in a bubble and just read books and <laughs> things and listen to lectures on science. So, um, hmm, so I'm not sure what, what the what the drawing for that poem is or how it's after Natalie Wood, but a very cool poem. I love that. Thanks for sharing that, Ted. Um, and now let's see. Let's go to um, here's a, sh a short poem. This is uh, Peter O'Donohue, and uh, this is now this time. And um, I should say Potter, sorry, Potter O'Donohue. I think I've been pronouncing that wrong the whole time. So here's uh, Potter O'Donohue with uh, Now This Time for hate, for good, for change, for reason, for despair. Now is the time for Armageddon. Now is the time to stand up. Now is the time for talk, for bullets for banners, for people into, street, into the streets, for people into the graves. Now is the time for reason. Now is the time for indictment, exclusion, exoneration. Now is the time of dread. Now is the time of panic, for joy, for eating and drinking and starving. Now is the time for words. Now is the time for silence. Now is the time for truth. Now is the time for lies. Now is the time for the tiny child to reach out its hand in trust and for the giant dog to no longer bite. A uh, very good poem there. That's Potter O'Donoghue. Thanks so much for sharing that. And um, let's see. And this is Patricia Casey. Oh, wait, no, this was last week. Never mind. Um, okay, so I think that is going to be it. I think we got everybody. Um, yeah. So let's move on to uh, the haiku really quick for today, the Saiku. And the Saiku for this week is based on this story. This is from um, the University, uh, or, or Duke University. Here, this is... Uh, uh, birds shuffle and repeat their tunes to keep the audience listening. Um, song sparrows switch up the playlist and remember the pattern for at least 30 minutes. So there's a certain kind of songbird. What, what is the... Um, um, a, the tweets of a little song sparrow in its bird brain are a lot more complex and akin to human language than anyone realized. A new study finds that male sparrows deliberately shuffle and mix their song repertoire, possibly as a way to keep it interesting for the female audience. And what was fascinating about this, so, so um, is these uh, sparrows play their music. They have these little short songs. Um, they have a track list almost of about 12 of them usually. And they'll play like certain numbers in a row. And then they call it, um, what is the phrase for it? Um, you know, once they kind of, once they, if they play it too many times, what is the f time phased? Long distance dependencies. So they'll remember how often they played these songs um, up to 30 minutes later. So if they played one song like 10 times in a row or 10 times over a short period of time, they'll wait longer before they play that song again for the novelty to sort of return and to, to be like a like an echo or like a callback and like a stand-up comedy routine or something. And um, and it reminded me of um, the way words we talk about in the, uh, in the workshops that we do, the Critique of the Week, how sometimes words repeat too often too close together. And that's something that you hear in your ear. There's like a boredom to it, right? Um, and so a lot of times we'll say, like, this word appears too close to this word, or you use this word too many times. And the amazing thing is that sparrows, with their tiny little bird brains, um, recognize the same impulse. And so that drive to novelty is, you know, who knows how many millions of years old, or, or um, you know, if it exists in birds, too. It's really fascinating to think about that. So I thought that was a very interesting little article. And here is your Saiku that w that article inspired for this week. Songbirds. Wearing out an old mixtape. Songbirds wearing out an old mixtape. That is your Saiku for today, and that is the show for today. Uh, next week's prompt is going to be, many people have already guessed it in the show notes, or in the, in the uh, chat window, I should say. But the prompt is going to be to write a Lennon lyric. Uh, you know, we talked about Lennon lyrics. I do, um, I don't like it when it's just 
Uh, and this was me coming up with this. So I don't like it when there's just the form. I prefer a little bit of nudge in some direction. So write a Lenin lyric set in winter, since it's winter. Um, a winter setting for a Lenin lyric. That is your prompt for this week. We talked about Lenin lyrics the whole episode um, with Lester, but but that's um, an 18 lines, six verse, six lines per uh, stanza. And then at the beginning and end of each line um, is the same word in some way. Uh, and the last word of each stanza, or the last line of each stanza, that, that pattern shifts just a little bit. So he had like um, behind and behold, I think, or something like that. Um, so you can listen to the back through the episode to see all the rules of a Lenin lyric and look at some examples that Lester has and other people have written. There's a, um, let me find this other, maybe right before we go, I'll, I'll, I'll read a Lenin lyric that's by someone else. Um, this is uh, yeah, here we go. This is Scott Corbett Riley. And this is the, uh, this is the submission. It was like the, this is from our Poets of Faith issue, right on number uh, 45. And um, this, this is titled Lenin Lyric. I'd seen Lenin Lyrics in submissions a few times already. And um, this is what made me curious about Lester. And then, you know, five episodes, five issues later, we interviewed Lester. Here, I'll play, uh, play Scott Corbett Riley reading this Lenin Lyric to close out the show. Lenin Lyric. Even picking up the dry cleaning, even chewing the Eucharist or at home chewing thought, he thinks, can anyone hear my thought? Hello, he says to passers-by, hello, without a word, but they continue without a glance. It's like he thinks his voice is an unneeded glut, and language too unneeded. But when he avoids language, he thinks, but words keep cropping up, which of course are words, so language must be to thinking what so many stones are to quarries, or many steps are to a path, and to lose your step, what's that? To wander into the brush of what's not? And what would your feet be if they're not feet? Which is to say, could you trust your feet if they weren't called feet, to carry you if the path you're on's not a path but words, and the, it, we, them, everything's a part of it. Yeah, it's a wonderful Lennon lyric called Lennon Lyric by Scott Corbett Riley from the title number 45. So that was your prompt for this week, write a Lennon lyric. And uh, next week's guest on the Rattlecast is going to be William Logan. Uh, William Logan is, some people call him the last critic. Um, he's one of the few you know, people who writes very serious poetry criticism anymore. Um, um, so he's, you know, people have also called him one of the most hated men in poetry for that reason. I mean, there's a way that we try to be nice, and, um, and William doesn't uh, go along with that and, and believes in the uh, power of criticism. And so I'm um, a longtime critic, but also his most recent book is Rift of Light. He's a very fine poet, uh, one of the sort of condensing and just sort of distilling everything and using form and, and just a wonderful poet in his own right. And his most recent book is Rift of Light with that beautiful cover. That is Rattlecast number 130. Uh, it's going to be the regular time, noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific on Sunday, February 6th next week. Hope to see you then. Hope you have a great week. And uh, I will talk to you soon. Goodbye.